afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Caladelli. I'm the uh, Secretary General of ESSA. Uh, you've probably heard a lot about ESSA in the last 10 minutes, so <laughs> I'm going to explain who we are and what we do. Um, Unibet is, yes, as Eric pointed out, is one of the founding members of ESSA. Uh, when we started in 2005, we were five members. We're now almost 20 members. Um, we represent the online betting industry. We represent the uh, retail betting industry. We represent uh, former state monopolies, such as PMU, which is over there. Uh, and we also uh, represent an Asian operator, the Hong Kong Jockey Club. So we're not just exclusively European. Um, so we were established uh, back in 2005 uh, as a result of a match-fixing scandal that took place in Germany, the Heuser Affair. Uh, the Heuser Affair involved a German referee who was targeted by the uh, Croatian Mafia. And what happened in that particular scandal was that the, um, the Croatian Mafia had runners going around to the uh, state monopoly odd set and putting bets on the outcome of the matches, which Robert Heuser was then basically fixing for them. Uh, when the German authorities started to investigate this, uh, they went to some of the big online operators and asked them how much money they had lost because odd set, the state monopoly, had lost X million amount of euros. Uh, so when they went to the big operators uh, who were operating online in Germany, uh, and they asked them, well, how much money did you guys lose? And they said, well, we didn't lose a penny. And they said, well, how is that possible? Because Oddset lost X million amount, and you guys haven't lost anything. And they said, well, look, everything online, exactly what Eric has described earlier, uh, is fully traceable. When you set up a, a, an account with any operator, for example, Unibet, you're going to have to give a lot of information about who you are. You're going to have to give credit card details, passport details, and in Denmark, you even have to give EID details, I think, as well. So there's a lot of information there that the bookmaker has about you. And so in effect, what you're doing is you're leaving a digital fingerprint. And as we know, criminals don't want to leave fingerprints. So as a result of that, uh, in 2005, a number of the leading online operators decided to get together and create an association that could monitor uh, irregular betting patterns. Um, as Eric described, um, each member can monitor individually what they are doing. But that doesn't mean they have enough information there to know whether something is unusual or suspicious. You have to be part of a much broader network of operators to have a full picture of the landscape. So that's why uh, ESSA was created, and particularly for this reason, because they needed to have a mechanism where they could share information formally with each other. Because before, you just pick up the phone to your friend who's working for BWIN, you know, Unibet, and they'd say, okay, have you seen anything? You know, so this was a need for, for, a, um, for a trade association to deal with these types of issues. And we're going back to 2005. So this is already 10 years ago that we've been involved in this, uh, uh, in this, in this business. Um, since then, um, we've grown, uh, as I've mentioned. We're now 19 members. We should be 20 by the end of the year. Um, but also, our mandate has changed as well because when we started, the raison d'etre of ESSA was specifically on the alerts. But this whole issue of match fixing has become highly topical. Uh, a lot of government institutions have started to get involved. And as an industry, we've had to position ourselves as well because we need to explain to people like yourselves, to decision makers, exactly how our industry works. That's fundamental because if we don't explain what, how our industry works, then policymakers in particular will make decisions which aren't based on facts, but just purely fiction. And what I mean by that is they will want to start to try and regulate certain types of bets. For example, in-play betting. We've heard a lot already about how in-play betting could impact the integrity of a sport. Well, from a betting operator's point of view, it actually has no impact at all because the amount of liquidity on the market is so low. I mean, if you were to bet uh, on a Champions League game, on a yellow card, I could be wrong, Eric, but I think maybe 50 euros is a maximum. Something so like that, yeah. 50 euros in a Champions League game is not a lot to actually, to actually uh, for any criminal to make a profit. Um, The UNESCO Declaration of Berlin, I think this sums up exactly why the legal operators are involved in this whole area as well. I mean, you can read it there for yourself, but we are, as Eric has already mentioned, we are dependent on the integrity of sport. Um, we need it if we want to offer our customers a fair bet. So it's fundamental that we also help to try and combat this. 
So our activities, well, we have an early warning platform. Um, as, I, uh, as Eric mentioned, each individual member is looking at their own trading, uh, trading patterns, betting patterns, and then if they find anything which is suspicious, they will then feed that to ESSA. We will send an alert out to the rest of the membership asking them for information. We pull all that information together. We have a head bookmaker who will then analyze all of this, and then he will then make a decision of whether or not something is unusual or suspicious. If it's suspicious, and we will go to, um, to the next, uh, to this slide here. If it's suspicious, it will get reported to the, uh, the sport or the regulator, depending if we have an MOU with the sport um, and if we have an MOU actually with the regulator as well. And if it's not suspicious, then it is logged. So we have that information in a secure platform. Um, Declan mentioned the education campaign, I'm and Eric also mentioned it. I'm a little scared to mention it myself, but <laughs> I have to because in 2009, I had a meeting with the EU athletes. Now, the EU athletes is an umbrella organization for players across Europe. Um, we had a meeting, and they came up, to, uh, came up to me and said, look, everyone's talking about betting. We don't know anything about this. Uh, we're not getting any information from the federations. Can you tell us about it? And we said, yeah, sure, sit down with us. So we actually set about creating an education campaign. Actually, it was the first education campaign of its kind, where we targeted the players. So it was players going into the players' dressing rooms and talking one-to-one -one experience. Of course, there's a whole online part to it as well. In Denmark, that meant it was handball uh, that we focused on because um, that was the, the sport that was represented by the EU athletes. So it was very important. In 2013, we received funding from the European Commission, um, actually up to 500,000 euros worth of funding to roll out this education program. Now, the issue with the education program, of course, is that you can sit down a player and you can tell them whatever you want. It's what's going in between their ears as well. Uh, they have to pay attention to this. And I think hand and heart, we can say that a lot of players probably aren't paying as much attention to that part than they are to their sporting part. Um, we're also involved uh, at a high level with the European Commission. We're one of the experts on their working group. Um, we've been working with the European Parliament on a number of different positions there. Uh, and more significantly, we've been working with the Council of Europe. Now, both Eric and Jack mentioned the uh, Council of Europe Convention on Match Fixing. Uh, ESSA was one of the stakeholders that was actually involved in, well, preparing that. We gave our position um, and we helped actually take that document from when we started in 2010, which is basically attacking the betting industry, to a point where actually it talked about cooperating, because that is actually what we want. We want to be cooperating with the different stakeholders. Um, talked about the SL alerts. So we have all this information coming into us. Um, and this year, what we decided to do uh, was to have a quarterly integrity report so that everybody could see what we are actually seeing. So this is for Q1. Um, you can see that we had 49 alerts which were raised. Um, and of that 49, 25 were found to be unusual, but 24 were found to be suspicious. And those 24, broken down here, I don't know if you can see that, but of course, tennis was the top one, with 17 found to be suspicious. Then it was football, table tennis, ice, ho ice hockey, and snooker. And these were all the alerts that were reported to the, in, to the different sports federations. If we look to the last quarter, we just uh, released this, uh, I think, back in July. Um, 73, 73 alerts were raised, and 23 were reported to sports bodies. Again, you'll see the problem child, tennis. Um, I think Jack already explained a little bit about tennis and um, why that could be, um, uh, yeah, could be the problem child because because of the nature of the of the uh, of the event itself. So, what do we need to do? Um, for us, it's extremely important that we are working together. We're not the enemy. We want to be working with the different sports. We want to be working with the different regulators. We want to be working with the law enforcement agencies. Um, that's extremely important. That's the only way this is going to work. We've been working with the IOC now for the last four years. We have a very good relationship with them. They've involved us in all their working groups. Um, and we have a very good uh, exchange of communication with the IOC and with the Tennis Integrity Unit as well. 
Um, we also need an evidence and risk-based approach. Um, I talked about this earlier, but when decision makers are making policies, they need to get away from the, the fiction about what bet, online betting is in particular and what bet types are bad. And there's a number of uh, pieces of research out there. Uh, I think one of your colleagues, Jack Ben Van Rompuy, he actually did a study on in-play betting um, and he found that there's actually no risk to in-play betting at all. Um, yes, international sports government governance templates. Um, one of the most interesting statistics to come out in the last few years was Sport Accord. Um, Sport Accord represents, I think, like 120, or used to, because I've had a few issues with the IOC, um, has, uh, used to have at least, let's say, 120 members. Um, and when they did a study on how many actually had betting rules in place, I think less than 20 had betting rules in place. So that tells you exactly where a lot of the issues are coming from. We need to have sports up to a standard where they're not being regulated, they're all self-regulatory. In fact, we could all create our own sports federation here right now. Unlike the betting industry, we are all regulated. In Denmark, the UK, France, we're regulated. So we need to have some sort of international standard for sports as well that they could adhere to. And we advocate that all operators should be part of a monitoring system. We represent pr predominantly the uh, uh, the online uh, private operators, but my colleague Chris Rasmussen, he works for the European Lotteries, uh, they represent the state monopolies, but whatever, uh, whatever type of organization or company you are, you should be part of a monitoring system. And that monitoring system should then be feeding into national contact points, which is one of the key points of the Council of Europe Convention. Um, I think that takes me to the end, so I guess we'll have the panel debate. <laughs>